Can an orc be redeemed? Well, the answer to that is yes, but also no. Well, then again, uh, kind of maybe, except not really. However, it is, well, it's complicated. Maya Govan and Melanine, and welcome to another episode of Tolkien Untangled. So, before I get into specifics on the question of potential orc redemption, I first have four caveats and a fundamental point to make. First caveat, Tolkien never really settled on how exactly orcs ought to be. He never came to a conclusion that he himself considered satisfactory. And over the span of his lifetime, he gave quite a few different versions on where they come from and whether or not they're like soulless automatons bound to the will of the Dark Lord, or whether they're closer to what we might call people with free will. And I think the reason why Tolkien struggled so much with this and why he never really came to a concrete conclusion is because the question is kind of like the rope in a metaphorical tug of war. On the one side, for plot reasons, orcs really do need to be inherently evil and beyond any reasonable chance of redemption, otherwise it opens moral questions about our good guys. Moral strength is an enormously important theme in pretty much all of Tolkien's writings, and it's a theme that gets massively undercut if we go down rabbit holes about sympathetic orcs being slaughtered by the heroes. We can safely say Tolkien did not intend for his readers to boo Aragorn and cheer for the orcs as he cuts them down. However, on the other side, for more spiritual reasons, Orcs need to have at least some chance of at least theoretical redemption, because if they're entirely evil, that undercuts one of Tolkien's more metaphysical themes, which lies right at the heart of his legendarium's moral point. Throughout his life, Tolkien's mental tug of war on this issue continued, and he died before either side ever outmatched the other. Second caveat, what exactly do we mean by redemption? I don't want to get bogged down in the endlessly circular realm of semantics, but I guess what I'm talking about revolves around whether orcs have any like positive potential. Could they contribute something that's at the very least half a millimetre above morally neutral? Or are they always, in one way or another, just bound to be awful? Third caveat, Tolkien first started writing about the orcs as far back as 1917, during World War I. In the early 1970s, so a lifetime later, he was still writing about them. But over the span of that life, those writings changed. So although we can cherry pick all kinds of quotations about orcs, it's not enormously helpful to hyper focus on one particular point if that point forces us to ignore or discount the lifetime's worth of other writings that might contradict it. For example, there's one moment in The Hobbit where a number of orcs all join in for a musical number. I'm not sure that that's proof though of orc choreographers or vocal coaches making up a significant subsection of orc societies. It is not evidence of orc glee club. And my fourth caveat, half orcs exist, but I think the question of their redemption is quite a different one to what I'm going to talk about today. Just to quickly make contact with them though, yes, I do think half-orcs could, at least hypothetically, live a life with some positive potential. They are half not orcs. Anyway, those are my caveats, now for my fundamental point. Tolkien told us, in no uncertain terms, when the first Dark Lord, Melkor, created the first orcs, it was the worst thing he ever did. Everything he did in Middle-earth was awful, but corrupting the children of Iluvatar, aka elves and men into orcs, was in Tolkien's own words the vilest deed of Melkor and the most hateful to Iluvatar, aka basically God. And there's nothing that Tolkien ever wrote which contradicts that. Orcs aren't just bad people, they are an abomination against nature. They should not exist in creation, and the fact that they do is an insult to the supreme and morally good creator 
whom ultimately created even Melkor. I linger on this because it's an important nail to hammer down. Orcs are fundamentally different from people. Even the worst people ever to exist are still people. Elves and men and dwarves are all capable of doing very bad things, but even at their most awful, the fact that they exist is not an atrocity against creation. But with orcs, it is different. They aren't just one of the many races of Middle-earth. They're not like dwarves or ents. They don't just happen to have a warlike culture. They are Melkor's vilest deed. They are his most hateful rebellion against Iluvatar. Orcs are evil by nurture and also evil by nature. I'll go on to add more complexity as this video continues, but we mustn't lose sight of this major point. Just because elves and men and dwarves can, or sometimes do, bad things, does not make them morally equivalent to orcs. No being that wasn't corrupted by the Dark Lord could ever be morally equivalent to an orc. However, that's not the end of this discussion. Because the other fundamental point to make is that Iluvatar will always beat Melkor in the end. Iluvatar is the creator, Melkor can only corrupt. And as I've commented many times before on this channel, one of Tolkien's most important themes is that in the end, all things shall prove but Iluvatar's instrument and whatnot. So within Iluvatar's universe, could the stars align? Could some exceptional orc individual overcome their orcish nature and prove but Iluvatar's instrument in the making of something good? Or are they entirely irredeemable? Well, actually, that's one of the few questions that we do have a certain answer to. In Fascinating Letter 153, Tolkien wrote, Orcs would be Melkor's greatest sins, abuses of his highest privilege, and would be creatures begotten of sin and naturally bad. I nearly wrote irredeemably bad, but that would be going too far. Because by accepting or tolerating their making necessary to their actual existence, even orcs would become part of the world, which is Iluvatar's, and ultimately good. So no, orcs are not irredeemably evil. They absolutely suck because they are begotten of sin. They are naturally bad and they are Melkor's vilest deed. But Melkor is not where the uh, cosmogonic buck stops in Tolkien's writings. He too was created. In the beginning, he was the most powerful of all created things. He once had the greatest positive potential of anybody, but his pride and his envy and his spite drove him to rebel against his creator, Iluvatar. Melkor's free will allowed him to contribute absolute awfulness to the universe that he for a time dwelt in, but he was powerless to alter the fundamental moral framework of that universe. He vandalized it, he wove discord and darkness into it, but the creator of creation, Iluvatar, is fundamentally good. And also, fundamentally, beyond Melkor's comprehension, beyond any power of the Dark Lords to overcome. That is the moral point of Tolkien's mythology. How is this relevant to orcs? Well, orcs represent an excellent microcosm of this wider creation issue that I'm trying to get at. However, before we can get into it, we first need to pin down what exactly we think orcs are and where we think they came from. Because, as I said in my third caveat, the origins of the orcs is one of those things that evolved substantially over Tolkien's lifetime. But as I was putting the script together, I began to realize if I go into too much detail on all of that evolution, there's gonna be a 50 minute long video about orc origins within this already not short video about orc redemption. So I'm gonna have to cut it down to the basics. And I guess the most basic point to begin with, even though Tolkien threw loads of different ideas around when it came to where orcs came from, there is one constant that cuts through the core of them all. Melkor never creates 
his own life. Not like Iluvatar created life with the races of men and elves, and also when he breathed true life into the race of dwarves. In Tolkien's own words, I have represented at least the orcs as pre-existing real beings on whom the Dark Lord has exerted the fullness of his power in remodeling and corrupting them, not making them. In other words, no matter which version we go with, Melkor did not create orcs out of evil, he ruined them, out of something that already existed and wasn't evil to begin with. Something Iluvatar made. And remember, in the end, Iluvatar cannot be overcome. All things are his instrument. In Tolkien's writings, there's only one way to create true life, and that's by using the secret fire, or the flame imperishable, the mysterious power of creation, which Melkor coveted back in the day and went a long way into the void searching for. What he did not realise, the secret fire is an aspect of Iluvatar. Only Iluvatar can create a fear, a soul. That is crucial. And only a being that's metaphorically fueled by the secret fire can have what we'd call true life. And interestingly, and all importantly, after the universe was made, Iluvatar sent the secret fire into the universe to burn in the centre of the world, at the heart of Arda. This is an enormous part of why Melkor wants to dominate Arda so much, and it's why he's ultimately doomed to fail. Only Iluvatar can control the secret fire. And I think this explains how reproduction works in Middle-earth in like a spiritual way rather than biological. When elves and men and dwarves have babies, those babies grow up to have a fear because they are born of the children of Iluvatar, and because they are born within Arda, where the secret fire dwells. But Melkor's perversions, his orcs and dragons and trolls, they either don't have Thea, they are kind of like animals that Melkor's enhanced and distorted to his own ends, which is consistent with some of what Tolkien wrote, or they do have a Thea, but it wasn't created by Melkor. It came from Iluvatar. It was simply corrupted and twisted and ruined by the Dark Lord, but it originated with the secret fire. That's what gives it true life. Now, this question of whether orcs have souls slash fear is going to be really important going forward, but it's not an easy question to answer. Tolkien told us both yes and no multiple times with varying degrees of additional information. But I think if I were to ask you guys, and correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, but I reckon most people are of the belief that orcs were originally corrupted either out of elves or out of men, or maybe both. This is the version that's most consistent with the Silmarillion and the Lord of the Rings, and it's the one that I'm inclined to go with. I think it provides the most thematically interesting version to ponder. But it's far from an ambiguous fact. In his earliest writings, orcs were bred of the subterranean heats and slimes, their hearts were of granite, and their bodies deformed. And in the 1930s, Tolkien told us, the hordes of orcs Melkor made of stone, but their hearts of hatred. These early orcs do not have fear. They are, I guess, kind of like automatons. When Melkor says march, they march. When he says fight, they fight. When he turns his attentions elsewhere, they cease to truly live. They have no independent thoughts. They are simply fueled by hatred and awaiting further instruction. Now, this idea of orcs being fueled by hatred is a very interesting one, and it's something Tolkien came back to. But for the most part, in these early ideas about orcs, we aren't really talking about the same creatures that we meet in The Lord of the Rings. Shagrat and Gorbag and Ugluk and Grishnak are not mindless automatons, they are characters. Horrible, villainous characters, but characters nonetheless. They have terrible personalities. The orcs in The Lord of the Rings are much more in line with Tolkien's later writings, that orcs are corrupted out of elves, or in even later writings, men. In the Annals of Amman it's written, 
All those of the elves that came into the hands of Melkor were, by slow arts of cruelty and wickedness, corrupted and enslaved. Thus did Melkor breed the hideous race of the Orkor, in envy and mockery of the elves, of whom they were afterwards the bitterest foes. For the Orkor had life, and multiplied after the manner of the children of Iluvatar. Now, just a couple of caveats. Firstly, Tolkien did write in the margin next to this passage, alter this. Orcs are not elvish. And I should also point out this information is being conveyed in one of those it is believed by the wise type situations and not this is literally true. We can be certain elves believed that orcs were made from elves and men believed that orcs were made from men, but the, uh, the truth is not known. That being said though, if we accept that this is true, these writings do sync up very nicely with how orcs are portrayed in The Lord of the Rings. And I guess the implication of them would be that at some point early on, Melkor and probably also Sauron found a group of elves and or men whose Fea were created by Iluvatar, and he corrupted them into mockeries of what they used to be. Through slow arts of cruelty, he twisted their Fea and he turned them into orcs. And when these first orcs were forced to breed with each other in the manner of the children of Iluvatar, unpleasant, the life begotten from that union would be a little orc with its own little twisted corrupted Fea, just like its parents. But that Fea would ultimately have its origin with Iluvatar, and it would have been created by Iluvatar's secret fire, which now lies at the centre of Arda. In the Annals of Aman, Tolkien tells us, Deep in their dark hearts, the Orkor loathed the master whom they served in fear, the maker only of their misery. And I think that's a crucial strand to draw out of this question on Orc redemption. They are naturally evil, begotten of sin, fueled by a polluted, corrupted Fea, but fueled by a Fea that was not evil in the beginning. If something good can be twisted into something monstrous by the extraordinary will and malice of Melkor, surely with an equally extraordinary degree of will and benevolence, it could be twisted back. Which I'm going to use as a clumsy segue towards another question of how long do orcs live? I mean, if an orc's fea was corrupted out of an elvish fea, does that mean the orc would be immortal? Well, the truth is, we don't know anywhere near enough about orcs to hazard any guesses about their lifespan, although we do know from the existence of Bolg, son of Azog, that orcs can live up to at least a few hundred years, so even in the late Third Age, they are longer lived than most men. But we also have no idea what would happen to an orc's Thea after its body, its Hroa, is slain. When an elf is slain, its Fea remains bound to Arda, and it will remain in the uttermost west until Arda is remade. When a man is slain, their Fea will depart the circles of the world, and it will go to Iluvatar for some purpose that only he knows. What happens to a dwarf's Fea is a mystery, and so too is what happens to an orcish Fea, but my guess would be Iluvatar is the final destination. Anyway, I'll come back to the orc afterlife before I'm done, but I guess the question of whether their souls can be redeemed in the eyes of Iluvatar is very different from our original definition of redemption. Do they have positive potential in Middle-earth, in their lifetimes? And to talk about that, we need to talk a little bit about free will. And do orcs have it? Well, believe it or not, the answer to that is unclear. And it's made even less clear by the fact that free will itself is quite a slippery term to define, even at the best of times. In The Lord of the Rings, we are treated to a conversation between two orcs, Shagrat and Gorbag, in which Gorbag says, If we get a chance, you and me'll slip off and set up somewhere on our own. Which pretty much confirms orcs are not mindless automatons. They must have some free will. Although I want to point out, what Gorbag intends to do on his own is raid and pillage and loot. There isn't a constructive bone in his body. Anyway, in The Return of the King, we also meet two orcs who discuss whether the mysterious creatures they're hunting, Frodo and Sam, might actually be rebel uruk -hai. So it would appear, yes, orcs have at least some freedom of thought. 
although whether they're free to act on those thoughts is slightly different. But just to make things nice and confusing, Tolkien also wrote a paragraph later in The Lord of the Rings which kind of contradicts that. Although it's written in a very epic tone at a crucial moment in the story, and maybe it was intended to be read more like breathtaking mythology rather than a truly reliable account of what literally happened. But it's very interesting either way. So, in the moment after the ring is destroyed, when Sauron is vanquished and the Dark Tower crumbles and the army of the West is victorious, Tolkien wrote of the fleeing orcs, As when death smites the swollen, brooding thing that holds them all in sway, ants will wander witless and purposeless and then feebly die, so the creatures of Sauron. Orc or troll or beast spell enslaved ran hither and thither mindless, and some slew themselves or cast themselves in pits or fled, wailing back to hide in holes far from hope. And the implication here might be that without Sauron's power holding their reins, orcs become mindless and suicidal, or else flee screaming into the dark where they will cower for the rest of their feeble and pointless lives. To quote Tolkien again, Melkor held the orcs in dire thraldom, for in their corruption they had lost almost all possibility of resisting the domination of his will. In Middle-earth, free will appears to exist more as a spectrum than like a binary yes-no thing. Elves are free to an extent, but their lives are also bound to the music of creation, whereas men should have a virtue to shape their life beyond the music of the Ainur, which is fate to all things else. And the evidence suggests orcs do indeed inhabit some space on this free will spectrum. They're not totally mindless, but they are considerably less free than men or even than elves. I suppose orcs do have a limited capacity to do as they please in the same way that maybe a child soldier or an enslaved fighter might technically be free in some senses, but Melkor's overwhelming influence makes it so that they're never going to be free to choose to do good. They're never free to actively overcome the Dark Lord, and any positive outcomes of their actions would be unintentional and indirect. For example, they'll readily slaughter each other, and that might benefit the good guys in some cases, but the orcs aren't freely choosing to benefit the good guys, they're just being awful. I guess when it comes to explaining an orc's mindset, their core motivation, the thing that drives all of their behaviour is hatred. Orcs are kept ticking by hate. Which does explain how orcs can talk of rebellion like they do in The Lord of the Rings and speak out against their masters who they absolutely hate without ever having to be particularly free of the Dark Lord's control. Hating each other and hating themselves and hating their master is exactly what they're supposed to do. They're not meant to cooperate unless it's in the pursuit of some hateful end. They're not meant to be loyal, they're meant to be afraid. They're meant to be violent, they're meant to be full of hate. When orcs kill each other and speak hatefully against their master, it might seem counterintuitive, but they are actually demonstrating total homage to Melkor, to their corruptor. Now, just before I move on, I must point out that in some of Tolkien's orc writings, he suggested they might not be corrupted from children of Iluvatar, but instead orcs may have been made from corrupted animals, who were taught speech by Melkor but do not have a fear. And this does simplify the whole free will question a little bit, there are some interesting takeaways from these writings, but the truth is I much prefer the version where orcs come from elves and men. If orcs are corrupted from beasts, then their existence would be a more hateful deed against Yavanna than against Iluvatar, she was the lady of plants and animals and growing things. And I think this really undermines the central dichotomy of Melkor's corruption and Iluvatar's creation. This theme runs through the entire Legendarium, it's in my opinion crucial to understanding the orcs, 
And I think their story is much stronger if we go with Tolkien's more consistent writings about orcs coming from the children of Iluvatar rather than them being soulless talking animals. But I don't want to pretend that these other writings don't exist. Anyway, before we can venture deeper into the reeds of orc redemption, first I think we need to examine what exactly is the life of an orc actually like? You know, when they're not dying in battle, how do orcs live their miserable lives? Well, first thing to say, when an orc isn't being unambiguously evil, they're still unbelievably horrible. I've already mentioned that Shagrat and Gorbag conversation from the Two Towers, and I feel like that is sometimes put forward as a defense of orcs. Sort of like, look, here's proof that they're not all bad, they're just like us, they have hopes and dreams, and they just want to run far away and live happily ever after. But that is a stretch. In The Lord of the Rings, we get three major on-page interactions between different orcs from different groups. And although all of them are very interesting, I must point out all of them swiftly devolve into straight up murder. These are not wholesome interactions. It is true that at one point, Gorbag does say to Shagrat that thing I quoted earlier. What do you say? If we get a chance, you and me'll slip off and set up somewhere on our own with a few trusty lads. Which might suggest there's something close to a friendship between these orcs. However, it's also true that later that same day, these orcs all murder each other over a shiny piece of loot. And in the same conversation where it's suggested that maybe they should just run away together, Shagrat tells Gorbag about an orc in his company called Ufthak. Ufthak got stung by Shelob. He got wrapped up in Shelob's webs, and then he was left hanging in her lair, alive. Shagrat could have cut him down. He could have saved Ufthak, but instead the whole orc company laughed at his suffering, and then they left him to continue suffering. And in a completely different orc interaction earlier in the story, when the orcs of Isengard, who are carrying Merry and Pippin, catch up to the orcs of the Misty Mountains, who are about to be hunted by the riders of Rohan, the Isengarders jeer at the northerners, and mock them, and laugh at the fact these Misty Mountain orcs are all going to die when the riders catch up to them. So it's not so much that orcs don't care about the well-being of other orcs, I'm sure there are some men who don't really care about the well-being of other men, but with orcs it's more sinister than that. Orcs actively delight in suffering, and it apparently makes no difference to them who it is that's experiencing the suffering. The callousness with which they take joy in each other's torment would be considered among any other race of Middle-earth staggeringly cruel. The final interaction we find in The Lord of the Rings comes in The Return of the King. While Frodo and Sam are travelling through Mordor, they overhear a tracker orc and a soldier orc arguing about the war. These orcs are both just awful to each other, they're almost as nasty as, like, some parts of the internet, and they both seem surprisingly happy that things aren't going well for their fellow folk of Mordor. These orcs mock the Nazgul, they insult the orcs that died at Kirith Ungol, and the tracker orc says to the soldier, They've done in number one, I've heard which is a reference to the defeat of the Witch King in the Battle of Pelennor Fields, and I hope it's true. Now, needless to say, obviously, this conversation ends with the soldier orc trying to murder the tracker orc, except in this instance, the tracker orc kills the soldier first with an arrow through the eye. Then he runs off, abandons his duty, and commits the crime of desertion. Truly, I guess, orcs are about as high quality as the Dark Lords deserve in their slaves. Anyway, when the track is gone, Frodo and Sam comment on this all-consuming orcish hate, and Frodo says, That is the spirit of Mordor, Sam. Orcs have always acted like that, but you can't get much hope out of it. They hate us far more, all together, and all the time. Hate really is the operative word here. Orcs aren't loyal to their masters, they hate him. 
They aren't loyal to each other, they take delight in the suffering of their own kind, it's just that the other folk, they hate even more. There's only one orc in any of Tolkien's writings who ever exhibits anything even close to a redeeming feature, and that orc would be Ugluk, the captain of Saruman's Isengarders. Unlike other orcs, Ugluk is at least relatively loyal to his master, he's not grossly incompetent, he's more disciplined than most, and he is at least kind of brave. I know that's not much, most terrorists would probably fit in that description, but I guess that's how low the bar is when it comes to finding an orc with any decent character traits. Now, I talk an awful lot about Ugluk and Grishnak and the Alliance of Isengard and Mordor orcs in this video, so check that out after this one, there's a lot to say about those orcs. But even Ugluk, arguably the best orc, is a million miles away from what anyone would consider good even by the standards of his evil master, Saruman. In Tolkien's chronology for The Lord of the Rings, he tells us that while the Fellowship of the Ring are hanging out in Lothlorien, they are safe from Ugluk and his Isengard orcs. But the orcs know the Fellowship's in there, and as soon as they leave the Golden Wood, they will become vulnerable. So Ugluk and his orcs are instructed to watch the river to lie in wait to keep their eyes open, and to track the Fellowship as they leave Lothlorien and enter the wild. All these orcs have to do is be a little bit disciplined, a little bit patient, and just do nothing. Wait for their enemy to come to them. But even the most disciplined orcs in all of Tolkien's writings, even Saruman's uruk who are known for their superior training, just don't have what it takes to do that. We are told, before long, the uruk lose interest in watching the river, and instead they journey south and start scouring the lands of northern Rohan. They simply can't help being violent and destructive, and as a result, they aren't watching the river when the Fellowship does leave Lothlorien, and the Ring makes it a long way down the Anduin before the Isengarders have another opportunity to attack. It does seem brutality is all they are capable of. Which brings us to the question of how do orcs live their lives when they're not under the dominion of a Dark Lord? After the First Age ended, and Melkor was cast into the void, orcs were, for a while, masterless. After the Second Age, they were in a similar situation, although of course Sauron did return, and as I've already mentioned, after Sauron's final defeat at the end of the Third Age, his orcs ran witless and purposeless and then feebly died, if we accept that paragraph as literally true. So does that mean an orc without a master is like, I don't know, a boat without a rudder? Are they incapable of higher function without a dark lord giving them instructions? Well, it would appear the answer to that is, again, both yes and no. In the tenth book of the History of Middle-earth series, Tolkien tells us, when Melkor was at last removed from Arda at the end of the First Age, the orcs that survived in the west were scattered, leaderless, and almost witless, and were for a long time without control or purpose. And this syncs up pretty perfectly with what we are told in The Lord of the Rings about orcs running witless like ants after the downfall of Sauron. I guess early in the Second Age, Sauron recruited many of Melkor's purposeless orcs and brought them under his dominion. But before that, those orcs were, apparently, just vicious, witless drones. However, there may be a little bit more to it. After all, Sauron lost a great deal of his power after being defeated in the War of the Last Alliance, after Isildur cut the ring from his finger at the end of the Second Age, but only two years after that, Isildur was killed at the Gladden Fields by some of Sauron's remaining orcs. I don't want to over make this point, the orcs that killed Isildur were hardly strategic masterminds, but they did set up an ambush, they did attack in unison, and they did, in Tolkien's words, prepare their assault. In Isildur's own words, there is cunning and design here. 
So, although Sauron's power was, at least significantly, diminished at this time, his orcs weren't entirely mindless without him. Although, it's also important to note, the orcs who killed Isildur did not know that Sauron had lost the War of the Last Alliance. They believed he was victorious, and that Isildur and his men were retreating after being defeated by the Dark Lord. So these orcs were under the impression that Sauron still ruled, and they thought they were acting on their master's behalf. It's also important to note, unlike at the end of the First and Third Ages, at the end of the Second Age the Dark Lord was defeated, but not vanquished. As we all know, Sauron eventually got better. So maybe that's the reason why the orcs who survived the end of the Second Age weren't quite so mindless as the orcs who survived the downfalls of Melkor and Sauron after the First and Third Ages, who went on to be described as witless and purposeless. The orcs at the end of the Second Age simply weren't quite so masterless. Anyway, I feel like so far, the picture I've painted is one of orcs being relentlessly terrible, and pretty much beyond any hope of redemption. But that's not the note that I want to end on. Tolkien did tell us that, at least theoretically, orcs are not irredeemably evil. There is never, ever any example of an orc being anything other than awful. Tolkien gives us zero evidence to suggest that any orc was ever redeemed in Middle-earth's history, but at least ontologically speaking, we know it's not utterly impossible. So what would it take? Like, hypothetically speaking, what would have to happen for an orc individual to achieve some semblance of positive potential? Well, first and foremost, I think they would need an intensely compassionate sponsor. Someone on the side of good who would have to go to enormous lengths to try and change the fundamental nature of the orc in question. I don't think an orc could ever make that change on their own, but if, for example, the loveliest person in all of Middle-earth dedicated their entire life to this task of redeeming one single orc, potentially, in time, maybe they'd see some results. But it would have to be an uphill battle. Tolkien actually gives us some excellently interesting insight into how elves and men perceive the nature of orcs, and also how orcs perceive elves and men and it's really quite relevant to a lot of what I've been talking about. So, in the year 1960, Tolkien wrote, Orcs might have become irredeemable, at least by elves and men, but they remained within the law. And in this context, law, with a capital L, refers, I believe, to the overarching designs of Iluvatar. Anyway, Tolkien goes on, that is, that though of necessity, being the fingers of the hand of Melkor, orcs must be fought with the utmost severity, they must not be dealt with in their own terms of cruelty or treachery. Captives must not be tormented, not even to discover information for the defence of the homes of elves and men. If any orcs surrendered and asked for mercy, they must be granted it, even at a cost. This was the teaching of the wise, though in the horror of the war, it was not always heeded. This paragraph is a great reminder of just how good the best of the good guys are in Tolkien's writings. Our hypothetical sponsor of a potentially redeemable orc would have to be constantly proving to that orc in question that they will never treat it the way that it would always treat them. All orcs ever seem to do is take delight in suffering, but it's the teaching of the wise that suffering should not be inflicted upon orcs, even if it's necessary in saving lives. But there is an asterisk on that quotation about orcs surrendering and asking for mercy, and it leads to an all-important footnote. Tolkien also told us, Few orcs ever did so in the elder days, and at no time would any orc treat with any elf. For one thing Melkor had achieved was to convince the orcs beyond refutation that the elves were crueler than themselves, taking captives only for amusement 
or to eat them, as the orcs would do at need. Over the years, Melkor wove an all-consuming fear and hatred of elves into the hearts of all orcs. They believe that elves are even crueler than they are, and that surrendering to an elf would result in the worst fate imaginable. Despite the magnitude with which orcs hate everything, they don't hate anything as much as they hate elves. Thus, I think it would be practically almost impossible for an elf to be the one who redeems our hypothetical orcs. Orcs have just been far too radicalised by Melkor for any elf to ever bring them back from the brink. But what if the person trying to redeem the orc wasn't an elf? Let's imagine, instead, a morally exceptional wizard who has nothing else to do with their time except, maybe, redeeming an orc. Such a wizard doesn't really exist in Middle-earth, but I'm going to use Radagast the Brown as our example. Because unlike Saruman and the Blue Wizards, there's no version of events where Radagast ever turns to the dark side, but unlike Gandalf, Radagast never really seems to be all that busy. We know next to nothing about what he was doing for 2,000 years in Middle-earth, but whatever it was, he was doing it quietly and away from the watchful eyes of the people who write the histories. So, although Tolkien never gives us any reason to believe that this is true, let's pretend Radagast spent hundreds of years trying to redeem a single orc that he found wandering in Mirkwood. For this orc to be redeemed, Radagast would have to spend a long time consistently working on its redemption. And for that to happen, this orc would have to be, in some way, imprisoned. But as with everything, this imprisonment would have to be ultra-compassionate. The orc would have to be, metaphorically, beaten over the head with this idea that Radagast and his friends are never going to treat it the only way that it knows how to treat others. Every time the orc tried to do something cruel to Radagast, Radagast would have to eclipse that cruelty with kindness. He would have to be relentlessly forgiving and almost infinitely patient. But in time, with this insane degree of merciful perseverance, perhaps Radagast's orc might reach Smeagol levels of benevolence. I reckon Radagast could eventually convince it to maybe go off on its own and find firewood or fetch water or do some other amoral and very easy to achieve task. The orc might even start showing reverence towards Radagast, who it starts to see as its new master. Perhaps it could even be trusted not to hurt what it considers other servants of Radagast. But I believe this semi-redemption could only last as long as the orc remains insulated from all other servants of evil and so long as the stakes remain low. Even if this undying orc served Radagast for a thousand years, and in all that time Radagast was only ever an entirely and astoundingly positive presence in the orc's life, I think it would still only take one moment for that orc to turn back to a life of violence and slaughter. Radagast could smother it in moral bubble wrap, but I don't think that would change the fact that this orc's heart is fueled by hatred. Its fear is twisted by Melkor's malice. Even Gollum, who isn't an orc and is in theory much easier to redeem, only ever really flirted with redemption. He was shown enormous amounts of pity and compassion by Frodo, and while things were going well in Ithilien, Smeagol was relatively loyal. He fetched the Hobbit's conies as a gift. But in the end, when the going gets tough, Gollum betrays that compassion with treachery. Then he betrays it again. Then he betrays it again. Much like Gollum, there is a part of me that really pities orcs. They're not supposed to be the way they are. They are suffering because of it, and they totally are slaves. There's a part of me that even pities the Nazgul for the same reasons. And yet, because of all those reasons, I think there is a limit on how much can reasonably be done to redeem orcs in Middle-earth. 
In practical terms, I think you'd have an easier time leading a herd of mumakil through the eye of a needle than you'd have at meaningfully redeeming an orc. But in Tolkien's own words, they are not irredeemable. So how can this be? Well, let's say that Radagast's semi-redeemed orc ran into another orc. It remembered what its instincts were telling it to do, and after a thousand years of painstaking effort, this orc relapsed back into savagery. It betrayed Radagast, and as a consequence, one of Radagast's bird friends pecked our orc to death. In the moments that followed this semi-redeemed orc's demise, one of two things would surely happen. If our orc's feyre was corrupted out of an elvish feyre, it would presumably go where elvish souls go after they die. It would go to the halls of Mandos in the uttermost west. And the halls of Mandos are ruled by the doomsman of the Valar, the great judge, Mandos himself. And Mandos, keeper of the dead, has a sister, Niena, the lady of grief and sorrow and pity, the deity who taught Gandalf the value of compassion. And the other brother of Niena is my favourite Valar, Irmo, the lord of sleep and dreams and visions, and Irmo's wife is the Valier Este, the gentle lady of rest and of healing. Also, Mandos's wife is the Lady Vire, the Weaver of Fate, and Mandos, Niena, and Irmo combined are known as the Feanturi, the Masters of Spirits of Fea. So, surely, if any orc in Arda could possibly be redeemed, Mandos, Niena, Este, Irmo, and maybe Vire would be the five most qualified beings to make that happen. Tolkien never wrote about it, so this is purely speculation, but I would suggest if our orc subject's Feyre was safely held within the halls of Mandos, where Melkor had no power, and if the Judge of the Dead and the Lady of Pity and Mercy and Compassion and their sister-in-law, the Lady of Rest and Healing, all worked together for the enormous swathes of time they had available to them, maybe they could undo to that Feyre what Melkor did to it all those years ago. They could untwist it, cleanse it, turn it back into the Feyre of a child of Iluvatar, and in so doing, redeem it. And if Radagast's orc didn't have an elvish Feyre, if it was corrupted from a mortal man, it would presumably experience the same post-death fate as the race of men do. Its Feyre would be held for a short time in the halls of Mandos in the uttermost west, but then it would be released beyond the circles of the world. It would depart the universe and go back to its creator. Back to Iluvatar. And as I said right at the beginning of this video, Iluvatar beats Melkor every time. He creates life, he controls the secret fire, Melkor only corrupts. So it surely doesn't really matter how much Melkor corrupts any given mortal's Feyre within Arda, because in the end that Feyre will depart Arda, and it will return to Iluvatar, the creator of everything. According to Tolkien's mythology. Evil exists in Ea in the universe because Melkor rebelled against his creator in the very beginning. He wove discord and corruption into the music of creation. And orcs are the most quintessential example of that corruption. They are Melkor's greatest insult to Iluvatar. But Iluvatar beats Melkor. Melkor is powerful, but Iluvatar cannot be overcome. And the moral point of Tolkien's entire legendarium, Iluvatar is good. So I suppose, with that said, in the very end, how could orcs not be redeemed? 
Originally, they came from Iluvatar, and once death has freed them from the Dark Lord who perverted them, their spirits return to the All Father who made them. He who created all things which the Dark Lords can only corrupt. It would seem Tolkien wanted us to believe that orcs do indeed receive some redemption after they've been set free by death. Anyway, that's about it for this video. Thank you very much for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, be sure to hit like and leave a comment and click subscribe to make sure you don't miss any future videos coming soon. But until next time, as always, my dear friends, much love, stay groovy, and Navire Melanine.